We welcome you to the after show um, get together of the Preachers of Detroit. I'm sure many of you watched, and tonight we're uh, so happy to have four of the Preachers of Detroit that are with us tonight, and we're going to ask them all the questions you want to know uh, tonight. I really joined the Preachers of Detroit because of the cast man. When I heard Bishop Ellis and Bishop Vaughn and Bishop Langston and Dorinda Clark was going to do it, I was going to do it. Any regrets? Yeah. One regret. What would that be? Oh, One Lord. regret. Oh, Lord. Was it in the first first show? No, no, I, I don't. Oh, I don't. I don't regret <laughs> going to a hookah bar. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> you said it. I was just saying. I mean, in the air nine times uh, doing ministry outside of my church. I, I can't go anywhere. From children, children watch that show. Right. Uh, right. Children. Uh, uh, Everybody enjoyed the show, and, and, and they were not disappointed that I was who I am, you know, and they said, man, you, you, you are who you are, you know, true, true to yourself. And as you said, uh, I think that uh, when you really look back at the uh, series, series one, uh, I think, because I know these individuals now, everybody was pretty much true yeah. to who they were, absolutely. Well, are you utilizing your platform on the show to actually expand your brands? I am. <laughs> <laughs> this was a tremendous moment for me at 62 years old to get this. Looking good at 62 win. years old, okay? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to ride my horse till they fall out and then I'm going to give it some five hour energy. And have pray for and that horse going to rise up and we're going to rise up. working on a book called How to <laughs> Did you really just take it there? Oh, do you really feel like this? How was that inspired? Was that inspired by someone? <laughs> <laughs> that inspired? Oh, nobody in particular. Oh. Nobody that you would <laughs> Nobody that I know. What to do after you don't meet the city council president? <laughs> Almost everybody on this stage probably has had a situation with you on the show. <laughs> do you think that? Because you're the common denominator, do you genuinely ever look at yourself and say, maybe the problem is me sometimes? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not the problem. No. See, you have, to, you have to understand, I'm the turn up man, right? I'm, 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 I'm the kind, I'm not Kanye, I'm Cayenne. Pepper, you pepper, see what I'm I bring the seasoning and the spice. I, I make sure that we keep it live, that we keep it real, that we keep it that 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 it's wholesome uh, and and entertainment. We this is what people understand. Reality TV is entertainment, That's right. That's right. right? And and um, everybody kind of you know when you're a pastor, you're in the habit of being dignified. You know you you wake up in the morning, you yawn. You, oh. <laughs> you know. You shower dignified. I mean, everything you do is dignified. And so you need a little bullock in your life, you know, right? Some vitamin B, right? Vitamin to, to, B. to break through that dignity a little bit. We got to break through that dignity, right? So, okay, I hear you. Do you? He would be doing all that. He would be. But he would not drive a Rolls or a Porsche. Well, oh, 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 he absolutely might drive a Benz. <laughs> I'm saying why, if you if you gonna talk, if why would he say, not drive a Benz? If you gonna say all those things, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he live in a wonderful house? Too? Absolutely. Well, you know, I don't know what Jesus would drive, but you I know he would be I like you. I don't know where Jesus would live, but I do know what his agenda was for his people, and and I think ultimately we stand on good ground. He says, "What? I was hungry, you fed me not." I was in prison, you didn't come see me. I was naked, no clothes, right? I mean, we know <coughs> Jesus had a particular agenda when it came to people who were being uh, exploited or people who were on the bottom of the society of their day. But Bishop Ellis, you, you, you kind of pick back on what I'm saying. What, what about the family in the world? Jesus is huge. Absolutely. And you can't confine Jesus to walking in sandals. <laughs> he, did, he did that because that was his time. And that was the era that he was that he was manifested in the flesh. We also see him walking on water. We also see him appear to his disciples on the water. So we also see him going back to heaven without a Bentley, a Rolls Royce, a chariot, or anything. So, so Jesus is huge. And we've got to endeavor to see all of Jesus. I could ask the question, 
do you want to serve Job's God? Or do you want to serve John the Baptist's God? Mm-hmm. He's the same God. But Job has an experience with him until he was the most wealthiest man and still was a man of spiritual integrity. So much so that when he lost it all, he maintained his relationship with the Lord. And the Lord, after allowing him to lose it all, didn't leave him in that situation, but made him twice as rich because of his faithfulness without it than he was before he had it. So then we have to be very careful when we said, if would Jesus drive this? Would Jesus live here? Uh, would he live in Oak Park? Would he live, would he live in the Brewsters? I, I believe he would live everywhere because he's omnipresent and he fills all spaces. So I choose to live with Jesus in Bloomfield Hills. <laughs> I don't disagree. This, you know what's crazy to me about this? When uh, uh, Brother Wilkerson says WWJD, people buy bands and put it up in their churches and go and have Bible studies, asking the question, what would Jesus do? He turns that what would Jesus do into a multi-million dollar question. When Bullock says, would Jesus drive a Bentley? Same question. <laughs> Same question. People turn it into uh, sacrilegious. How can he be challenging for it? WWJD, would Jesus drive a Bentley? What's that? Uh, WJD. B. 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 It's the same question. Notice, I never said Jesus would not. Right, right. Right? Right. And, 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 no, and, no I'm, just, I'm just saying for the sake of the sake, I'm like, and, I just raised and let me jump the in question. Here. I just and, raised the question. And, and, and let me jump in here. There was no fight when he said that. No. There, 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 was no, there was no how dare you. I didn't mind the question because he's asking a question that most people watching TV want right. to know. Would ask. That's right. So I, I don't get offended by that. You talked about your, your, your testimony but, is amazing. So what made you genuinely say, I need to give my life to God and I need to, to bring others to give their life to God? You know, it, it got to the place, Randy, I was at the end of the road. You just said it. Took a 357, put it up to my head, was ready to pull the trigger. And uh, i never forget it, clicked it twice, literally pulled it. And as I was pulling it, I knew I was ready to go. I was ready to die. Uh, my mind got to the place it was playing tricks on me. I had contracts out on my life as a young man selling drugs in the streets of Detroit. Lost, no father, uh, no sense of direction, uh, no guidance there. And just got to the place where when that happened, I had lost everything. You know, um, you know, being young and selling drugs, you know, I had fast cars, uh, fast women. All of a sudden, uh, none of those things were there. Contracts out in your life. And I just wanted to end it. It got to the place where I felt like my family couldn't forgive me. Uh, people were literally prophesying in my family uh, by the time I was 19 that I was either going to be dead or in the penitentiary. So I, I felt like I didn't have anything to live for. And uh, i never forget when I clicked it, uh, uh, I clicked it twice real quick, boom, boom, and nothing happened. And I just began to weep and I began to cry. And I thank God that nothing happened that I'm sitting here now today. Uh, in fact, I remember one instant I went through to a topless bar here in the city, very famous topless bar. Everybody in there knew me. I used to do VIP at 16, I was getting VIP. So as soon as I walked in, they put me in the VIP booth. I don't have no VIP money on me. I had probably about $20. I was mad at my bishop. I was mad at the church. And I never forget, I'm sitting up there. And so, you know, the young lady, you in VIP, you the man, you got money. So everybody is coming over there to me. I don't have any money. These two guys that I know walk in. They're killers. They walk in. I don't know that they're here. Somebody tells me that these two guys over here sent you this drink. I drink it. It's orange juice. That's an insult. In the street, you send me a drink, I need a drink. They sent me orange juice, i never forget it. I go to them, I said, man, what's up? What you, you know, was this a game? And they cover my eyes and they tell me, you're not supposed to be here. You made it out. Don't you ever come back to this scene wow. again. Because, a- I mean, they told me, they said, you, you're our only chance. You're the only one that we know made it out. You were sincere. We don't know what happened. You started preaching me right there. Started telling me a story about a young man they knew that was serving another pastor who got hurt and, and, and his life got messed up after that. They said, that will not happen to you. Mm. They said, you got uh, two options. Either you get up and walk out or we're going to get up and walk you out. And I walked out, went back to church and never looked back. And got you together. And got you together. <laughs> So you mentioned that if you had to choose between your man and your ministry, that you would choose your man. Is that still true? 
That's not what I said. No, no. <laughs> no what I said was marriage is an option. Uh, my calling is not. Okay. I was called before I got married. Okay. And um, I stick, I, I'm, I'm very settled there. Um, I don't apologize. I don't, say, do I don't apologize. <laughs> what do you um, uh, because I think that what people need to understand is that um, the the mar marriage for me is probably not what it is for a lot of women. Uh, marriage for me was and is uh, an option. It's not something that I uh, probably needed to do. Uh, I opted to do. My calling, I first, I, I first heard the Lord speak to me at four years old. And I've heard that consistent calling all my life. And I knew that if I ever got married, that whoever came into my space would not just marry a normal, regular girl. So we, we spoke on a little bit on women in ministry and women in the church. Uh, you and Dorinda have very different views on women's, where, women, where women stand in the church. Does those differences in perspective make it hard to work together? No, no. Um, uh, the Clark family and my family, I've known them all my life, pretty much. Um, I was a little stunned to actually hear it on the show. A lot, though, again, got edited. Um, I think that if we're going to build the church, if we're going to build people, we have to, ex we have to expect and respect diversity. It, one doesn't mean that we're wrong or right. We both are right. She's right for who she is. I'm right for who I am. But in the body of Christ, there is diversity. My foot doesn't do what my elbow does. My eyeball does not serve the same function as my kneecap. My eye doesn't fight with my knee. My ankle doesn't fight with my ear. Just because it's not the same doesn't mean it can't work together. And so I honor the ministry that that girl has. She's a phenom. Um, she was at Greater Grace not long ago and wrecked the house. She wrecks the house. And I told her the other day, I said, that blessed my house, that her newest release. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, uh, yes. It brings tears to my eyes. Because the line is, she always says, is God, while I'm out here doing your work, bless my house. Mm -hmm. And that blesses me. So she blesses me when she sings, when she ministers. I know that I bless her, Nikki, her husband. And so we got, we got to stop fighting over the issues that we don't agree on and work together on the things we agree. We agree that the devil is a bad devil and that Jesus is Lord and that the cross saves and that the Holy Ghost empowers. We believe that. So it doesn't really hurt me in any way, you know, that we're different, but we are serving the same God. So, I keep hearing you guys talk about season two and this is our last question. Is there gonna be a season two? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, um, I, I haven't heard. You know, I think we need to hear from the people. I think the people need to, uh, you know, uh, call call Oxygen, call L Plumber Media. You know, I mean, let 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 Oxygen. folks know. Oxygen.com. Yeah, Oxygen.com. Oxygen. Com. Right. You know, people you. thought they they saw the glory. They just got a glimpse in season one. Uh, they need to be touched again and look again, and, and and they'll see something even greater. Well, you know, the way it ended in terms of the last show. Uh, when the credits started rolling, I was stunned because it, it rolled. I, I just was shocked that it rolled on Gil and I. So it left us with a cliffhanger. So the indication is that they certainly left it in such a way with me on the floor. <laughs> my God. <laughs> totally, totally angry. Thank the Lord my face didn't show it. But uh, the credits show that at that moment this was a cliffhanger. And I think that the editing proves that they are definitely working on season two. Uh, quickly, Bishop Ellis, you would do it again? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. All right, give the cast a hand, everybody. Give our host Randy a hand. Thank you all for coming. Thank yeah. you all so much, and we'll see you next season, Preachers of Detroit. Yay. Yeah.